Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? All right. Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, some quick housekeeping message. Please uh, silence your phone or turn them off. Um, and uh, we're going to start shortly. And I'm so happy that y'all can be here with us. And if you're watching online, I'm happy you can watch online. Uh, I am Carl Constant. I am one of the assistant directors of Multicultural Affairs here on campus. And I am introducing uh, my supervisor, Dorothy Plez, uh, the, assistant, the associate um, dean of student, who will we'll do our welcome. Thank you again. Welcome everyone, and oh, I guess I can take my mask off. Welcome everyone, and thank you for being here this evening to kick off Black History Month at North Central College. We realize we have a number of people joining us virtually via the North Central College YouTube channel, and we'd like to extend a virtual wave to you as well. I would like to extend an extra special thank you to Carl Constant and the rest of the students, faculty, and staff on that Martin Luther King and Black History Month committee for their hard work on planning a great lineup of events and being adaptable in their execution. I would also like to thank NICOR Gas and BMO Harris Bank for their ongoing support of our MLK and Black History Month events. Without your support, our events would not have been possible. In my 11 years at the college, our MLK and Black History Month events have been one of the most enjoyable and impactful experiences every year. Not only do we gain knowledge and inspiration from our prayer luncheon, teach-in, keynote, and student events, but it's also a key event that brings together our campus and community. Black History Month is a time for us to reflect as a community on the contributions of black people to our history and culture. We also reflect on how systemic racism and oppression have often stood in the way of progress. Recent threats to voting rights, anti-racist education, and equitable rights for the poor have shown that we are still fighting the same battles that our predecessors fought before. Today's news of bomb threats against our historically black colleges and universities is also causing anger and fear. We join as a community looking for rejuvenation and inspiration. Our theme for MLK and Black History Month events is Keep Moving Forward. The theme is taken from a speech that Dr. Martin Luther King delivered titled, Keep Moving From This Mountain, to the students of Spelman College. One of the most poignant quotes from this speech is, if you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. This quote relates to tonight's speaker who started from South Central Los Angeles to college, moved to a Super Bowl championship, and turned all that into a career as a Hollywood writer, producer, and inspiration for a hit TV show. I'm excited to hear his inspirational words of how he kept moving forward. Thanks to all of you for being here. Next, I will hand things off to the introduction of our speaker. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Yes, people are out there. Um, my name is Michael Mays, president of the Student Governing Association. Tonight, I have the great honor and privilege to be able to introduce the Black History Month keynote speaker, Spencer Paysinger. Mr. Paysinger is a Super Bowl champion, linebacker turned Hollywood writer, producer. He brought his own touching story of living in the South Central LA and playing football at Beverly Hills High to the hit CW and Netflix series, All American. All American is a story about being an outsider in two worlds, says Paysinger, who develop award-winning show that is involved as a producer of All American. All American shows that it doesn't matter where you're from, we all go through the same sadness, loss, and sorrow. It's a real life story about making connections and starting conversations between people that may not have had the conversations before. 
Like the Spencer character based on his life, Paysinger grew up around drugs, gangs, violence, and poverty of the South Central LA with um, education-focused parents and had a dream of going to college. A promising athlete who played four sports but excelled in football. He was offered the opportunity to attend Elite Beverly Hills High, going on to lead the football team as captain to an undefeated season. A scholarship to the University of Oregon followed where Pace Singer also became team captain and was a part of the team's very first undefeated season. Graduating with a bachelor's degree in economics, he began his NFL career with the New York Giants, winning Super Bowl 46 in his rookie season. Pace Singer played seven seasons with the Giants, Dolphins, and Panthers. In 2017, a few months after pitching, all-American, he retired from football to pursue his dream of developing television and film concepts focused on black experience in America. Within four months of retiring, he was shooting the pilot for All-American. Now a sought-after writer-producer, Pay Singer has written and developed various concepts under his More Street Productions banner with Uninterrupted and Deviance Media. He is currently writing a film for Ron Howard, and Brian Gazer's Imagines Entertainment. Committed to leveraging his success to create opportunities for young people, Pace Singer serves on the board of KIPP's Public Schools Black and Latino Leadership Committee with the goal of creating programs for the KIPP's South Central Youth. He also serves on the board of Lyft City Works Council, which dedicates over $50 million a year to support locally driven community initiatives. Paysinger is also a co-owner of Hilltop Coffee and Kitchen, a fast casual eatery with an allegiance to underserved communities. Thank you and please let us all welcome Mr. Spencer Paysinger. I'm a little nervous right now. This is, my, this is my first ever speaking at a college university, so thank you guys for having me. This is, you know, a little jittery right now. <laughs> um, my name is Spencer Paysinger. It was a, a, a great intro. I feel like I should walk off the stage now because I, you said it perfectly. Um, I struggled with deciding what to talk to you guys about today because, you know, with, with varying projects and you know, mentally my own sort of transition out of the NFL, which I still believe I'm actively still transitioning out of four years later, um, there's still so many things that just sort of bobble around in my head of, of topics that I wanna to present to you guys and, and introspection that, that I'm still dealing with currently that I just feel like could possibly be you know, of interest to you guys. So, I really landed on, on three moments within my life that really brought me here today. Uh, if you guys are, want to listen, I'm going I'm to detail a few of them for you. Um, the first one I like to call my generational pivot. Um, this is something that happened in 1969, um, and it's, it's, it's important because it is February 1st, Black History Month. Um, and I really want to give a nod to my grandmother, Leslie Pacinger. Uh, God rest her soul. She's somebody that was the heart of my family. Um, she's passed away now a little over, little over 10 years. Um, but there was a decision that she made uh, back in 1969, panning a few years that drastically changed the outcome of my entire family. So now, before I even start, some of the stuff I say will be in conflict to what you guys have seen in All-American, if you guys have seen All-American, uh, and we can definitely get into that after the fact. But I'm actually gonna tell you guys sort of the true story behind how I came to be at Beverly Hills High School. So 1969, uh, given the era of the 60s, free love, um, Beverly Hills High School, actually, the students at that school petitioned the school board to integrate the school. They felt in the 60s that Times were changing, um, you know, communities were start, starting to mix a little bit more, and they wanted a realistic view of the world. So they went to a, their art teacher at Beverly Hills High School, petitioned him to petition 
the, the school board to integrate Beverly Hills High School for the first time ever. So that school board actually went to uh, Baldwin Hills, Lamert Park, uh, black neighborhoods that had the same social economic standard as, as Beverly Hills High School, or at least close to. And what started was a, a two-year process of potentially integrating uh, black and brown students into Beverly Hills High School to give them sort of the same opportunities as kids from that side of the tracks. Now, my grandparents, they raised my dad and his brothers off of Slauson and Western. It's two blocks away from where they filmed Boys in the Hood. A lot of the B-roll in Straight Outta Compton was shot around the corner from our house. And it's actually the house that they grew up, the house that they grew up, the, the house that they raised my dad and, his, and my uncles in is the house that I grew up in. So at the time, my grandmother, I'm sorry, I'm, again, I'm a little nervous. Like, you guys are a little nervous. <laughs> At the time, my uncles and my dad went to Emerson Middle School. This was a school that was in the same area of where Beverly Hills was looking at to integrate the schools, but they did not live in the district. But my grandma actually petitioned Beverly Hills to allow her, to allow her sons to go to Beverly Hills even though they weren't in the district. So Beverly Hills said, okay, we're gonna allow your firstborn to go. Uh, Carter Pacinger, I believe he started there in 19, 1972. That started the trajectory of my entire family. So my Uncle Carter started in 1972. My dad started, I believe, in 1975. And since then, the Pacinger family has actually been at Beverly Hills High School since the early 70s. If you go to Beverly Hills right now, the weight room is actually named the Pacinger Family Weight Room. So again, I'm kind of messing up some All-American stuff for you guys. <laughs> but I always knew I had to go to Beverly. This was something that's different from All-American, but growing up, I was a ball boy for Beverly Hills High School. I was a water boy. Um, just, I was always ingrained with football culture at Beverly Hills High School. I never knew anything about the academics there. I just knew every Friday, my grandmother would pick me up, she would take me to McDonald's, and then we would drive out to the, to the football field to be a ball boy, foot, uh, water boy, what have you, anything to help. My uncle who was the head football coach at the time, my dad who was the offensive line coach at the time, my other uncle who was the defense coordinator at the time, and his wife, who was a nutritionist at the time. So I'm telling you guys, when I'm saying I was at Beverly Hills High School since I was literally two weeks old, I was at that school since I was two, since I was two years old. But I talk about that generational shift that my grandmother had the foresight of forcing her kids to go to Beverly because, again, I'm not standing on the stage talking to you guys if my grandmother didn't have the fortitude to fight a school district actively trying to keep her out. So fast forward, I'd say, what, 30, 40 years. Um, I'm in eighth grade, and this is around the time when, you know, when you, when you try to decide what high school you're gonna go to. Now, growing up in South Central, I went to a school in Inglewood, and a lot of my friends were going to Inglewood High School, going to Crenshaw High School, going to Culver City. I was the only kid that I knew that had to go to Beverly. Now, as opposed to the TV show, instead of going from Crenshaw to Beverly, I went from middle school straight to Beverly High School as a ninth grader. I was 5'7 on a good day, 160 pounds, um, had glasses, had breathing problems, um, wore Lex Specs, the big goggles, um, but I knew I had to go to Beverly. It was something that I tried fighting. I did not want to go. I wanted to go to Inglewood. I wanted to go to Culver City. I wanted to go to Crenshaw with my friends. But my parents said, your uncles went in the 70s. Your older brother went there three years before you. you. It's your time to go. And since then, we've had about eight or nine pacingers actually go through and graduate from Beverly Hills High School to the point where this past year, uh, 20, 2021, the last pacinger, I should say, just graduated from Beverly Hills High School. So, that moment of my grandmother back in 19, you know, late 1960s, early 1970s, really deciding that we could go to Crenshaw, we could go to Dorset, we could go to the, some of the same schools that the other kids in the neighborhood were going to, which would have been fine at the time, but my grandmother had the foresight to put us in a, a tougher curriculum, a tougher neighborhood in terms of just being an outsider. You know, I, I say Beverly Hills is not a tougher neighborhood in terms of gangs and violence or whatever, it's its own complete animal. Like it's completely different from what we grew up um, experience. You know, 
myself experiencing you know, drugs, violence, gangs, you know, threats from all different kinds, and my parents really keeping me in sports to try to keep me on the straight and narrow, Beverly Hills was a place where it was affluence. It was different drugs that teenagers were involved in. It was $100,000 cars. If any of you guys remember My Sweet 16, anybody who watched that show growing up, or am I too old? <laughs> if you watch Sweet 16, I had three friends from my high school actually be on that show because they had just these lavish upbringings where their parents would spend $100,000 on a birthday for them. Whereas I'm pulling up to that same car that they got for their birthday, that's $100,000. I'm pulling up with a 92 Honda Accord, just happy I have four wheels. So that was essentially my high school experience. It was waking up at 4.45, 5 o'clock in the morning, getting my little brother up, driving him across town to my grandparents' house so they can drop him off, and then trekking it for another hour or so in the morning to to Beverly to be there hopefully before the bell rings. And I would say, I'm, again, I'm not here today if I didn't go through that experience. So that generational pivot takes me to my next decision in my life that, again, has led me here to talk to you guys today. The second one is, oh, I mean, there's, there's so many, but, and I'm, I'm trying my hardest not to go through every single one, but the second one is pretty much deciding to stick with football. Now, you guys have seen the show, potentially, and I'm not making any assumptions, but um, by senior year, I'm 6'3", 205, uh, all-state receiver, all-conference receiver, unanimous league MVP. I have about five or six scholarships to, to play receiver at various uh, universities around the country. University of Oregon was the only school that offered me as a defensive player. Now, I had committed to Colorado for two weeks as a receiver. But I knew deep down in my heart I wanted to go to Oregon if they did honor my, my commitment. And after a few, a few weeks of not knowing if they would, they ended up calling me and saying they wanted to honor that commitment to bring me on as a scholarship athlete. So I get up to the school, and within two weeks, my position gets switched. I thought, you're not going to, I'm an all-state receiver. You're not going to switch me. Like, you're not going to put me on defense. You want to use what you have, you know? I was wrong. They said, although we like that you're a receiver, you're going to defense. Now, the first time I sort of questioned my ability on, on, in football came at that moment because I really wanted to play receiver. I wanted, I wanted the ball in my hand. I wanted to be the one making those decisions. But I took out a piece of paper and wrote down the pros and cons of being a linebacker in the Pac-10 at the time. Again, I'm an old head. It was Pac-10 in my day. Um, or being a receiver in another Power Five conference. And the benefits of being a linebacker far outweighed a receiver, being a receiver, to the point where I, I realized that I could use a lot of my abilities as a receiver to convert to being a sort of dynamic linebacker. So after three years, I started three years at Oregon. Um, I was a part of the first undefeated team. We ended up losing to uh, Cam Newton and the Auburn Tigers in 2011. Um, I kind of had this decision to where a year before that, we had lost in the, in the Rose Bowl to Ohio State. And any, I see Michigan, so I know you guys aren't Ohio State fans. If there are any Ohio State fans, I still, uh, still don't like you guys. But in 20, uh, 2009, we lose the Rose Bowl to Ohio State. Terrell Pryor had a career, season, a career game against us, and we just didn't see it coming. I had actually graduated that year and had a job offer for a company I won't disclose up in Portland to be fast-tracked into a management program. Now, I'm thinking, I'm a West Coast kid. I just played in the Rose Bowl. It's you know, the granddaddy of them all. The national championship isn't really like a realistic dream. So why don't I walk away from football now and get into what could be a really cool marketing career? You know, they offered me about 80K coming out. I'd, have, I'd be fast-tracked through this management program. I would oversee uh, the majority of the Pacific Northwest within this company. And I'm thinking again, I'm a 22-year-old kid, making pretty good money at the time. Why not take this opportunity? So I literally retired from football for about a month and a half. I told my, I told my roommates that I played with. I told my, my, my closest uh, teammates on the, on the football team. And I was gearing up to tell the coaches that, hey, my backup is more than capable. He actually had a long career in the, in the NFL. His name is Kiko Alonso. Um, I'm good. I, don't, I'm, I had a great career. Goodbye. 
Before I ended up talking to my coaches, my teammates came to me and said, hey man, we came here together, we're gonna leave together. You can't leave us. You know, we have to finish this thing together. And I jokingly told them, all right, I'll come back, but at least we have to make it to a national championship. Not win, we just have to make it to a national championship. So going into my senior year, I decided not to retire from football. I technically, I, I unretired. And I went into my senior year to where we went undefeated, ended up losing to Cam Newton and, and the Auburn Tigers in, in 2010. Now, storybook season it was absolutely great. Everything you can ask for, steam rolling through teams. Even the game against, against Auburn came down to a last second field goal. And I'm thinking, undefeated team, national championship, there's, I'm getting drafted. It's just a matter of where. I'm a three-year starter, absolutely getting drafted. Did not get drafted. So <laughs> this was at a time when, during the NFL lockout, it was 2011 during the NFL lockout, usually when you, get dra when you don't get drafted, almost immediately after that last pick is called, teams start calling you to scoop you up for free agent spots. Now, I knew that teams were interested in me. I got calls from teams during the draft saying that they were interested in, in signing me, and if they didn't sign me, they would want me to be on their, on, on, um, their free agent wire. And I was all excited for it, but I did not know that as soon as the draft ended, it's radio silent because we're still in a lockout. So for four months, I'm living back at home. I'm at my grandfather's house. I'm kicking myself because I turned down an 80K a year job just a year earlier, and now I'm training guys for you know, $25, $30 a pop just to have money in my pocket. So it all came down to, I believe it was July 25th, uh, 2011. The NFL lockout ends. I'm driving to work out uh, in Los Angeles, and my dad calls me, he says, you know, I, I think the lockout's about to come to an end. I'm like, oh wait, you know, hopefully somebody, hopefully a team calls me. Within five minutes of that phone call, uh, the, uh, the lockout ended and the Arizona Cardinals called me. The Arizona Cardinals, hour and a half flight from Los Angeles. Okay, great, I'm going to sign with you guys. Let me call you guys back in a second. I'm gonna tell my mom, tell my dad, hey, I'm about to be a Cardinal. Hey mom, I'm about to be a Cardinal, it's gonna be great. You guys can come out for the weekend. Okay, great, love you, son. Wish you the best of luck. Call the Cardinals back. Sorry, the position has been filled in all of two minutes. So that's when the mad dash started happening. It came down between uh, the Denver Broncos, the Dallas Cowboys, and the New York Giants. Now, I had done my homework in this offseason, uh, this, this sort of four-month hiatus. Now, I looked at every single team that needed an outside linebacker like myself. A little bit taller, uh, had some offensive skills if need be, but could guard running backs and tight ends out of the backfield. Now, looking at the, looking at the teams, the Denver Broncos was an absolute log jam getting into that position. They had drafted two linebackers my same year, and they, are, they also had two or three linebackers that they drafted the year before, so I knew in trying to crack that lineup, it was almost impossible. It was like they drafted Von Miller. I'm not beating Von Miller out for anything. <laughs> but the last two teams, the, the Dallas Cowboys and the New York Giants, it came down to one phone call. It came down to the Dallas Cowboys calling me like used car salesman and saying, you should be part of America's team. You should wear the star in the helmet. You should be with us because we're you know, the hot team in the country right now, which I don't, still to this day, don't understand how they thought that about themselves. <laughs> but I hang up with them. I leave it sort of non-committal because I just knew I had a, a, a few more calls to, to, to field. And the New York Giants called me and they said, hey Spencer, we've watched your film. Um, we saw we didn't draft you, but you on our draft board. We think you can do some really nice stuff for us. Um, and we need a linebacker with your expertise. Now when I did my research, the Giants were, the, were, I believe they were either one or two of teams that needed an outside linebacker with my expertise. So just off of one phone call, I decided to go to the New York Giants. And that led to what I would call a storybook season. Not, sto not storybook in the sense that you know, we went undefeated, we steamrolled every team, is that I experienced every single emotion as a football player that I can experience within that first year. From the highs of playing on a professional team, the year that Victor Cruz became Victor Cruz, the year that you know, Eli Manning beats Tom Brady for the second time in the Super Bowl, you know, playing against you know, guys that will be in the Hall of Fame one day, like you know, guys like Antro Roll, Justin Tuck, and again, if you guys don't know those names, look them up there. I still call those guys captain whenever I see them, 10 years later. 
But it was a storybook season because of that, because I got to experience being in New York for the first time in my career as a working professional and actually putting a notch on that city's, on that city's titles, where you know, the parade, the, the Super Bowl, everything was just, I still to this day can't understand how I was so fortunate to, in almost one, in almost one calendar year, lose a national championship and win a Super Bowl. So during this time, you know, the, the rigors of football, you know, you have to learn 20 new plays a day. You have to practice them two hours after you're learning them. And if you don't practice them right, they'll find somebody else to do it. Every off day for seven years in the NFL, I would go see a new movie. And it all started on the first off day I had with the New York Giants. This was a week after um, I committed to them on the side of the road in Los Angeles off of that one phone call that the Giants had. And for you know, five or six days, I was hitting six, five, 300 pound linemen every day. So I wanted to do something that completely took me away from, just took me away from the rigors of football. You know, I've, I've always believed that my, my strength is self-awareness. I always know where I stand with certain people. I always know where I stand in, in a business setting, in a community setting. And I knew that if I didn't have some type of release outside of my daily, I would literally go crazy. So I went to a theater about two, miles away from, uh, about two miles away from the stadium at 10 a.m. and I left at 9.30. I actually almost missed curfew and almost got fined about $10,000 <laughs> because I just wanted to, be, I wanted to be in a theater. I wanted to have that experience of falling into stories and forgetting about the rigors that came with football. You know, my body, my mind, the defense, the, the the politics, everything that encompassed being a professional football player, I just wanted to get away from it. And I felt that sitting in a theater, in a dark theater with my popcorn and my raisinets and my large water, that was my escape. So I kept that up for seven years. That was something to where when I was at the lowest points in my life, the highest points in my life, that was the most consistent thing about my schedule. Every Tuesday night, I would make dinner for myself or go get dinner and then step into a new movie. Didn't matter the runtime, didn't matter if it was an animation, if it was a foreign film, if it was showing 30 miles away, I would make time for seven years to see a new movie. So that takes me to my, technically my third pivot, my third sort of moment that brought me here today. About three or four years into watching these movies and just using that as, a, as an escape, I started calling out what was happening in movie theaters. You guys have all done it, you guys probably always have, like you guys probably are the person or, or, or have like a family member that's just like, ooh, he's dead, this is a trick, blah, blah, like just calling things out in theater. And I was never the person that was yelling it out, but in my mind and to my, my then girlfriend, now wife, she hated me because I would always call it out and be pretty right 80% of the time. So it just got to the point where I was watching these stories, I was seeing the flaws in them, I was seeing how they could have did things better, I was seeing how I don't understand how they even wrote something like this. And it just got me intrigued about wanting to write stories in the same vein. So what I did was I downloaded a script writing service that now I know that uh, most of Hollywood uses called Final Draft. It was a 9.99 program on my iPad and I wore that thing out. I, at that time I taught myself, I was teaching myself how to screenwrite by watching YouTube videos, uh, reading scripts online, um, watching movies with, without any sound just to see if the emotional beats would come through, watching movies with, with subtitles just to see if, if there was any lag or, or just kind of just putting myself back into school because this was a hobby that was slowly taking over my life. I graduated from the University of Oregon with an economics degree. So for my first three or four years in the league, I without a doubt thought I was gonna be the guy on Wall Street eventually brokering $100 billion deals, wearing the power tie, you know, living that life. But off to the side, I just had this little hobby that just kept taking over more and more of my life, which is screenwriting. So by this time, I've, I've been doing it a few years and reading books. I had a, probably over 100 scripts downloaded into my, into my iPad and, and my computer. And side note, if any of you guys are interested in screenwriting, any type of, any film that you guys like or wanna actually read, Go on Google, type in that name of that film and type in PDF afterwards and a version of that script will pop up somewhere. 
So just that's something that somebody gave that to me. It's sort of my homework to you guys. But for four years, and that's why I say I want to emphasize this was a four-year process. I was literally just on my iPad after games, flying home from Monday night football, from Sunday night football, from day games, when guys are playing dominoes and drinking and possibly sleeping, catching cramps on the airplane. I had my computer open, I was watching a movie, I was writing something, I was reading something, and that was the schooling that I needed to then take me into the next phase that, I, that I'll talk to you guys about. So after these four years of me just literally having this hobby that took over my life, a friend took notice. I sent him, a, I, I believe, a two or three scripts, and he said, hey, you're just, you're doing the work. I don't know if this is good, because I'm not a screenwriter, but I sent it to my friend, and he thinks there's something here. Why don't you guys get together and just see what happens? You know, just have a conversation. So on my bye week, my, my sixth year playing, I met my now producing partner, Dane Mork, and that first night that we met, we just started talking about how Los Angeles is such a big place and how two people can be from the same area but have two completely different upbringings of what Los Angeles means to them and just the depiction of Los Angeles. To him, this is a kid, predominantly white neighborhood, Palos Verdes, California, which is, you know, it's, it's beaches, it's oceans, it's, you know, those, those kids play sports together from like birth until college. Where I've come from, there's a lot more gang violence, a lot more, just a lot more of other stuff. <laughs> so that conversation actually started what would then become All-American because it all started with one question. He said, can you describe waking up in the morning? Like, how did you get to school? He thought, because I went to Beverly Hills High School, that I just lived in Beverly Hills High School. I mean, that I just lived at Beverly. But being a pace singer and having my uncle being the head football coach there, having my, my dad and my other uncle and my aunt actually working there as well, the football community within Los Angeles, if you know a last name at that school, you assume that they live in the area or, they're, or that they're, they're just ingrained in that area where we were all, trans, all the pace singers were transplants. So I told him, hey, I actually, I didn't live in Beverly Hills. Uh, again, some more All-American debriefing. I did not, I never actually lived in Beverly Hills. Um, I commuted every day, and he asked, what was that process like? I said, okay, you know, I, and I told you guys, it's waking up at 4.45, uh, 5 o'clock, getting my little brother ready, getting him to my grandmother's house, and me trekking across town to, to get to school, whether it be bus, whether it be hitching a ride, and, you know, eventually getting my own two-door Honda Accord, which I still love to this day. Um, but I told him that was my process, and he looked at me dumbfounded. I told him, hey, that, that was just a normal morning for me. He looked at me as if he saw a ghost. He's like, listen, man, I wake up at 7.30, I woke up at 7.30 every morning, skateboard to school, and still had 10 minutes before the, before the bell rung. You had an entirely different morning, an entirely longer morning before I even opened my eyes. And it got us talking about how just a perception of growing up in Los Angeles can be vastly different. But when we're out in the world, we both rep Los Angeles to the fullest. So I went back to playing again. I was still actively as my sixth year playing. And I get a call from him about two weeks later, a project that he was working on was sort of dead in the water about his neighborhood. And just on a chance happening, he pitched the idea of me to some execs. And it wasn't, there's a show about a kid living in both worlds, blah, blah, blah. It was, I had a really good conversation with this NFL player. He seems like he's interested in screenwriting. Oh, and by the way, he lived in South Central but went to Beverly Hills High School. So those execs thought it was interesting enough to have a conversation. But first they wanted to see what could be of this world. Now mind you, I had been writing for about four years now, so I knew structurally the beats to hit when telling a, you know, a compelling story. So he called me and said, hey, there's some interest here, can you write up something? At the time, I was studying against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, I'll never forget it. I'm literally opening my like 500 page uh, playbook, put it to the side, take out my computer, and I start crafting what would be sort of the genesis of what All-American could be. And I believe the, the, the most definitive line on that page was, the toughest part of my life wasn't spent between chalk white lines, it was spent navigating both sides of the track. And frankly, I'm not sure I'll ever be done playing. That sentence alone to end the entire write-up is what compelled Warner Brothers to reach out to me about two weeks after that initial call from my friend to say, there's something here, let's set a meeting. 
I knew by this point we weren't making the playoffs. We were statistically eliminated from the playoffs. So I made that, uh, that appointment right then and there. And less than a month later, I was in Warner Brothers office just having a conversation. And I didn't really know what to expect. It was, it was something that you just don't know. You just, you just really didn't know where it was gonna go. It was a completely different, a completely different environment than what I was used to. But I had execs looking at me saying, just tell me a few stories about your upbringing. So I told them stories that, again, were normal to me, but shocking to them. You know, I had a friend that, you know, overdosed on heroin and went away to rehab for six months and came back as if nothing happened. Literally, in history class, vanished for six years, I mean, six months, came back, sat down, and I'm looking at her like, you can't just do that. You have to, like, where did you go? Oh, I overdosed, it's fine, I'm back now. How, like, you wanna grab lunch today? It's crazy. <laughs> I've had another story of how my, my, my closest cousin was an accessory to a double homicide going into my senior year of high school and ended up spending 10 years in prison. And he did not commit the crime, but was a part of uh, the crime being committed. So as you can tell, if you guys have watched the show, some of these storylines are sort of the, the, the precipice of, of some of the characters within the show. But it was really me just telling them stories about my upbringing, talking to people that had grown up in LA but had never been to South Central or, or had only been to, or had only seen areas of South Central depicted on TV with you know, the Straight Outta Compton, the, the Boys in the Hood, the Menace of Society to where it was a completely different life to them. That's only literally 15 minutes away from where we were sitting at that point. So I'm still actively playing, I go back to playing. After that call, we went into contract negotiations for what would become All-American. So the last year that I was playing in the NFL, I was actively developing the pilot for what would become All-American. I'm talking literally being in the defensive meeting room next to Hall of Fame players, sneaking out to go hide in the bathroom and talking to our, the, the main writer of the show like, oh, like don't do football this way. Tell, he needs to score a touchdown right here. He needs to sacrifice himself. He can't score. Just, just all, the little, all the little things to, to, to pump my authentic self into the script because at the time I could not write the script myself because again, I was still playing. Now, going, going into my last year, I get released by the New York Jets and I did not want to be a Jet. Any Jet fans out there, I, I apologize. I did not want to be a Jet fan. I mean, I didn't, I didn't want to be a Jet player. Playing for New York Giants, you just don't want to do that. I'm a free agent for the majority of my last year playing. And I knew it was going to be my last year. I told myself coming into the league that I was gonna play seven years, I was gonna retire before I turned 30, and I was gonna devote myself to whatever that next career thing was going to be. As a 22-year-old rookie, I did not know what that was gonna be. I, again, I thought it was gonna be something in the finance world, something in economics, Wall Street, but never in my wildest dreams did I expect to be retiring to walk away to do a TV show based on my life. So throughout that, throughout that I'd say about three months of being a free agent, I'm training in the morning in Los Angeles. Me and my wife just had our baby. Uh, shout out to my daughter, Cairo. I love you, she's now four years old. Um, and I spent the afternoons working with our writer on the pilot. Now going into December, uh, I'm thinking, okay, this December is probably, you know, this is the last month, I'm not gonna get called. I had a good six years, you know, it's time to hang it up. I get a call from the Carolina Panthers and they say, hey, we have some injuries, we wanna bring you in for a special teams role and, you know, see if you can help the team win some games. So for three weeks, I was out in Carolina, and it was a great experience, but during my last week there, I had an epiphany. And this is kind of, kind of wrapping this up in terms of my timeline. For the three months that I was in Los Angeles, my barber vanished. Now as a black man, having your barber vanish is like one of the worst experiences of your life. <laughs> it's absolute. I made a short film about it. It is a horror film. It is a scary experience. But I'm sitting in a defensive meeting room and we're putting in our defensive install. This is Wednesday morning. This is the, the, the heaviest install of the week. We're putting in our blitzes. We're putting in our other pressures. We're putting in our base coverages. It's probably about, I'd say anywhere from 20 to, to 35 new defenses that we're putting in for that day. I had an idea to write a short film about a young black man losing his barber, having his barber vanished in Los Angeles and trying to find a new one. So in my defensive playbook, which I still have to this day, 
I started writing what would become an outline for this short film that I ended up shooting two years later. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna write a couple notes about it, a couple more notes. Oh, this is a funny line. Okay, but what if he does this? Okay, you know, I look up, it's 45 minutes later, they're on install number 25, I have not written anything in our defense install. It was the worst practice I had ever had as a professional linebacker. I did not know any checks. I did not know any adjustments. Again, the word, I probably should have got cut off of that one practice alone. But I realized being in that room against, being in that room with Hall of Famers, with guys that would be, like guys like Luke Keekley, guys like Thomas Davis, Shaq Thompson, um, Julius Peppers, these guys that will be Hall of Famers one day. For 45 minutes, my brain was in a completely different space. I did not know I was in a football room. I was in a world of screenwriting. I was in a world of building out story. And that was the confidence that I needed to actually walk away from, from the game. I knew that I was gonna be my last year, but as any competitor, you always think, what about one more? Let's see if I can get one more in me. After realizing that my mind was gone for 45 minutes, I walked out of that room and I said, whatever happens over these next couple of weeks, I know when the season is done, I'm done with playing football. Three days later, I get cut. And not for anything that I did, it was sort of a, a, a last in first out scenario to where they had to solidify the defensive line going into playoffs. And I was just a casualty of the time. And as opposed to, you know, if you guys seen Hard Knocks, you know, players are sort of shocked that they get cut. Coach Ron Rivera calls me in, there's a couple other coaches there, they're like, hey man, Spencer, we're sorry that we gotta let you go. And I'm like, oh, I bet. Okay, cool, you know, shaking hands. Who can I talk to about my flight, you know? Because I had known at that time, at the time that I walked out of that room, I was playing with house money. I knew my time as an NFL player was coming to an end. I knew I would not play another season in the, in the NFL because there was just this little story that I had been working on for about, about six to eight months that we had just submitted to Warner Brothers in hopes that it would get financing to at least shoot the pilot. So I get released from the Carolina Panthers on December, 20, December 29th, oh no, I'm sorry, December 28th, 2017. December 29th, I fly back to Los Angeles. I think it was Jan first week of January, I get called that All American is at least getting ordered to pilot, and that's just the studio is investing a handful of money to produce a pilot to see if we can test it, to see if it will be a, you know, a viable show on the network. That was all I needed. I said, you know what? I looked to my wife, I looked to my you know, eight-month-old daughter, and I said, I'm taking a leap of faith. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a TV producer. Didn't know what that meant. It took me over a year to understand what a producer actually was doing, but knowing that I was comfortable within myself to walk away from the game and dive into something different, that's all, that's all I needed. So I mentally retired December 29th, 2017. By April 2018, we were shooting the pilot. By May 2018, we were premiering it in New York. And then October, I believe 10th, 2018, it premiered on CW Network. And it, it's since then become CW's number one uh, TV show. It's become a consensus number one TV show on, on Netflix. And we sort of have the joy of having two different audiences explore the show at different times. Uh, and it's just been a, an absolute ride. But early on, I had to fight a lot of the stigma behind a football player. Now, a lot of the times, football players are considered dumb, um, unenthusiastic, they're you know, center of attention. Whereas me being somebody that wanted to be a screenwriter, I wanted to be there every day. I didn't want to just say, this is my concept, okay, you guys have fun, I'll come back when the premiere happens and I'm taking all the photos as if I did all the work. I wanted to be there in the writer's room. I wanted to be there on set, and I was. And it was a great learning experience because switching professions, pivoting into different professions, you're going to have sort of stigmas and assumptions made about you just because they haven't spent a lot of time with you. Now, I'm going into an industry that a lot of the people there did not play professional sports, did not play college sports, did not play in, a, in sort of that competitive environment. So when they see a 6'3", 240-pound man walking into the room saying, hey, can you teach me about story structure or can you teach me how to beat out an entire act two properly, they're looking at me like, shouldn't you be on vacation somewhere or shouldn't you be back playing football? 
And I'm like, no, I want to be here. I want to learn. And that was something the entire, my, I'd say my first year and a half retiring from the NFL, I grappled with. I grappled with understanding if, am I dealing with imposter syndrome? Am I dealing with sometimes people that don't even want me there? Or am I dealing with people that just don't know that this is a dream of mine? And but, sur but surely, little by little, moment by moment, conversation by conversation, I started changing those mindsets. And I'm not, I'm not saying I'm, I did it because I wanted to prove people wrong, because I absolutely didn't. I was comfortable in my own abilities. But I knew in order to, in order to be an active team member within this new culture, I had to learn their culture and then help and then apply myself to it in ways that could help me further along my career in TV and film. So. It's been four years, I'm still learning, I, I'm still reading books, I'm still writing scripts, I still have other projects up on the board, but I'm still a student of this game. I'm still, I'm still going ahead with it. And it's, it's funny sitting here talking to you guys today because the perception I often run across when I'm in certain settings is because you have a TV show in the air, you know everything there is to know about TV production and writing and story and everything. And I'll be the first to tell you, if I don't know something, I will tell you I don't know something. I'm only four years into this transition. I'm still transitioning, but it's a road I love. It's a road that I am actively following down. I'm, I'm, I'm again, reading books, I'm writing scripts, I'm asking questions, I'm making connections, I'm finding mentors. Um, and I just wanna be in this as long as I can. I, I actually consider screenwriting to be my very first career. Because football is not a career that you can play 40 years in and then retire and live off of your pension. You, if you play football for 40 years, you're not alive. <laughs> like your, your, your body is brittle. But screenwriting is something, and TV production, the, the entire world that that encompasses, that's something that I know as my first career that I'm very excited to stay down that road because I know there's gonna be so many just highs and lows. I welcome the highs as much as I welcome the lows because at the end of the day, it's just a learning experience. So. What I want to leave you guys with is, and I'm not sure how, are we good on time? Because I definitely want to open this up for questions. Um, I always feel it's best to, to, to talk with you guys instead of at you guys for the duration of our time together. But I want to leave you guys with my favorite quote. It's my lifetime quote that I, I'll probably get it tattered across my chest if my wife will allow me. But it's from a movie called The Players Club. And I saw a laugh. There you go, I heard a laugh. But movie from the Players Club, there's a quote in that movie that, came, that comes from a not so likely character, but the message still remains true. It's use what you have to get what you want. Now, the person that says this in the movie is not the right person that should be. Don't, don't follow that track, but follow the message. Now, when I was in, high, um, when I was in college, I knew I had the University of Oregon uh, behind me. I knew that if I cold called people, if I cold emailed people and said Spencer Pacinger, Oregon Duck, I would get that meeting. I knew once I got to the NFL, if I had the New York Giants uh, as part of my subject head, if I had the Miami Dolphins as part of my subject head, I would get into those meetings. I would I'd be able to ask those questions. I was using the resources that I had available to myself to go out into the world and get the things that I wanted. Now, what came back to me was mentors. What came back to me was knowledge. What came back to me was, was references of books and scripts and ideas and friendships. So I compel all you guys out there in college or beyond, if there's something out there that you want, you guys all have individual skill sets that nobody else possesses in this world. So please lean into that. Lean into your unique skill sets and go out and get what you want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Hold you again, on. Spencer. How did I how did I do? Was that my first time? How did I do? You guys Y'all hyping me now. Y'all hyping me now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again for coming. Um for time and because we know it's going to the weather is gonna get bad. We're not gonna open it to questions for everybody. I know you would like questions oh. from everybody. Um but I'll, I will ask you just, just a couple of questions that I have. Yes. Um, <laughs> right, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, right now. Not gonna let him take your questions. 
Do you want a question? Uh, so, one of my questions, or one of the questions I, I wrote <laughs> earlier, she didn't say anything, so I, was, I just moved on. <clears throat> uh, in the show, you, you hit a lot of social justice uh, aspect. Uh, can you talk more about that, and can you tell us about any future projects that you might be working on? Yes, yes. Um, so in All American, uh, we, we grappled with early on deciding if we wanted to tell a period piece because you know I'm, I'm 33 years old. I went to high school between 2002 and 2006 and my college years thereafter. But we felt like in order to reach a broader audience, in order to have larger discussions, we wanted to bring the show into a current day time period because when we were developing the show, a lot of social justice things were starting to kick up. Um, and we just felt like having a, a, a black lead on, on the CW could just open us up to so many conversations. And I felt like it, I give all the praise to our showrunner, Nkichi Okoro Carroll. She's, she's our showrunner, she, she mans the ship, she writes the best, the, your, probably your favorite episode is an episode that she wrote. She's an absolute beast, but it was her decision to really lean into that because she just felt like the show could be sort of that staple. Um, I always feel like every seven to 10 years that comes out high school show that kind of captivates the country where it's, uh, I believe it's like a Gossip Girl, uh, um, um, Dawson's Creek, uh, Friday Night Lights. Like we pulled, we have a lot of writers from those shows and we felt like if we did this right with a black lead, we could be the next sort of staple in, in terms of those high school shows that sort of captivate the country. So. Yeah, that's why. And then uh, in terms of projects, I'm um, executive producing a documentary about Bishop Sycamore, the supposed fake high school football program um, with Michael Strahan and Adam McKay. Um, I just turned in my first draft for a Disney feature that I sold to Disney early, this, uh, early last year that turned in my first draft. And I'm currently writing, or I say co-writing, episode 17 of season four of All-American. So those are the main things that I'm working on right now. Okay. You talked about your writing, uh, but you also have another business where you do coffee shop. Uh, yes. You have a coffee shop. Can you talk about that? And are you going to be the next Starbucks? <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Um, so the coffee shop is called Hilltop Coffee and Kitchen. If you guys are out in Los Angeles, please frequent us. Um, we have three locations right now. Um, it's co owned by Issa Rae a handful of NFL players, and uh, my good friends, uh, Yoni Hagos and uh, AJ Relan. It was just a thing where, again, when I was developing All American in that sort of four month period where I was a free agent, one of my good friends is a restaurateur in Los Angeles and said, you know, the area that we live in is a predominantly black neighborhood. It's one of the richest black neighborhoods per capita in the country, but the options aren't there for, for food and beyond. So we really wanted to put our staple uh, into the neighborhood by starting with a coffee shop. We're, we're opening two more concepts right now that are in development, but the coffee shop was something that we wanted to just give a space, just give a space to, to the community that says, hey, we don't have to, we don't have to take a step down just to get something that's you know, black owned, that's, that's empowering the community. And although we say we're black owned, we're, we just say when you walk into these doors, you're walking into a black experience. We're not shutting our doors to anybody. We're not saying no to anybody. We welcome everybody, but we also are fully aware that it is a black experience and, is, and it is black owned. Almost last question. Um, I'm gonna get one question out of there. You gonna get one question? We gonna fight the snow, but we gonna get some questions. <laughs> <laughs> anybody would like to ask a question, just. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned a few values and characteristics that you've exhibited in your life and you talked about self-awareness and you showed a lot of really proactively working towards your futures as opposed to being passive and um, just a lot of perseverance through your time. I just wonder if you could just, who did you, who, who would you point to in your upbringing where, where you really gleaned your, your values and, and character from. Oh, Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Um, a few people, and I, I always say that I have, I have many mentors, um, both family and beyond, and mentors that they may not know that they're my mentor, or I've probably never even met them before, but I still take cues from them, whether it's articles or videos or, or just things that I, how I see them moving. But 
I would say those early years, um, you're, I'd point to my older brother first. He was somebody that, uh, one of the strongest men I've ever met. Uh, he kind of taught me how to love football the right way. Um, another person, obviously my mom, my dad, like specifically, like they had such different views on, on how to raise me and my brothers in South Central. Um, but I, I always say they never really forced me to play football. My family is a predominantly football family. Again, football coaches, football players in it. Um, but I was never forced to play football by any means. They allowed me to be a young black kid that was just interested in everything. Like I won, I won art competitions when I was growing up. Uh, I, I drew Pokemon and, and, and Dragon Ball Z characters in class. Like they just allowed me to dive into anything, um, just anything that piqued my interest. And I would say the first official mentor that I had outside of my family was uh, a guy named James Harris. He was a nutritionist at University of Oregon, but he was that guy that just always had his door open to you. You can walk in, if you had a free two hours, you sit down and, and just you know shoot it with him. So he saw that I was an econ major, uh, and I was kind of rare on the football team, and he said, hey, something's different about you, I'm gonna plug you into the community, go read this book in a week, let's talk about it. Here's an article I want you to read, here's a guy I want you to meet, go have a coffee with this guy he owns, two or three businesses throughout Eugene, Oregon. I want you to see how he does his business. Um, so he was the first mentor that actively threw me out there and got me a sense of just what was out there beyond football. So shout out to James Harris if he's watching. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, you kind of touched on it, but like in All-American, obviously a lot of it's kind of dramatized just for TV. Mm -hmm. um, but what's it like kind of seeing your life be shown on television, but yeah. then also like manipulated to like yeah. be entertaining? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's weird. It's so weird because I'm assuming, you know, a lot of you guys have probably watched the show, so you guys have walked in with ideas about me that are probably not even true. I'm not that angry. Like, I'm, I'm like seven inches taller than Spencer. But, um, but I say that the, the, whole, the whole idea that the story is about me, like, I think we all kind of ask our questions, like, ask ourselves that question of, you know, if somebody were to do a film about me, would anybody watch it? Or, like, if my life was a TV show, would somebody, would it be interesting? And to finally have it, it was actually, it's very therapeutic because it's allowed me to go back to moments in my life that I thought were just normal for a young black kid in South Central to realize like, oh, that actually is messed up. You know, getting, getting pulled over, getting you know, handcuffed on Beverly Drive for, for no reason at all, um, racially profiled, and just little things like that that the, in credit to this to the writers, they wanted that from me. They said, listen, take some time. Like, Talk to your friends, like really dig into what made Spencer Spencer, you know, almost 20 years now ago. So very therapeutic to have these stories that I've literally lived out um, kind of come back forward. Very weird because some of the stories have changed and now people think one thing about me that's not true. Um, but I always welcome the, the, the opportunity to like come and actually like dispel some of those rumors and show you guys that like, Spencer James and Spencer Pacinger, although like almost symbiotic, are completely different people. So, yes. One last question. Raise your hands. I'm gonna go to the student over here. No, sorry. <laughs> I was gonna ask kind of like two questions, but I seen you was in a couple of episodes and you was like acting in a couple of episodes. Do you think you could like act, direct, or like where you see yourself? Um, like do I think I could act? It's terrifying. <laughs> it's so terrifying. Uh, so if you guys have, have watched the show, I'm like the tallest guy behind, Ty, behind Tay Diggs in all the football scenes. I'm technically the defensive coordinator of Beverly High and then Crenshaw High. Um, but as far as acting, I've always made the joke that anything that I write from now on, I'm gonna just like take one small role within it on some like 
like how Seth Rogen would take roles in his films. And at this point, if opportunities come from that, I'm not gonna say no. I think I'm in a position to where I just wanna say yes to as many things as I can um, and not really shutter myself from opportunity. So who knows, I may, I'll be the next Black Panther, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Spencer. <laughs> and thank you for all coming. Um, we have some other Black History events that's gonna happen uh, this, this year. And, but one more time for Spencer. I was almost gonna say James. Thanks, <laughs> <Hey>, Singer. <laughs> thank you.